Welcome back to the Creative Endeavor Podcast. This is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. It's real conversations with real artists. And I'm Andrew Tischler, and it is such a pleasure to have your company here once again. In this special conversation that I'm having with Jeff Hine, an epic artist based in the United States. Jeff produces some incredible portraiture and epic biblical scenes. His work is just off the charts, and I'm blown away every time I see one of his pieces come up on my social media feed. So you can follow Jeff right now on Instagram at Jeff underscore Hine underscore art and on his website, www.jeffhine.com, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Now here in this episode, I wanted to hear about Jeff's beginnings. Where did this all start for him? What was his experience with art school and how did he start to thrive as a creative professional in those early years? Jeff's story is amazing. He overcame some pretty profound challenges early on, ultimately to triumph, and it's super inspiring to hear. I'll let Jeff get into that in this conversation. Now, before we get stuck into it, could you do me a huge favor and leave me a rating or a review on whatever audio platform you're listening on? You might not think so, but it makes a huge difference to the show, and I really appreciate it. Also, in addition to that, another favor, if you don't mind, could you please tag me or use the hashtag the creative endeavor on Instagram and the spelling of that last word is O U R for endeavor. Now I know it's funny spelling, I guess, because I'm based here in the Southern hemisphere. I spell things weird now, but the creative endeavor hashtag the creative endeavor. If you're going to post this on Instagram and just let people know where you're hearing these awesome conversations. And if this is the sort of thing that you find inspiring while you're creating art in the studio, Share the love. Let other people know where you're hearing this. Thank you so much for doing that. And one more thing. Right now you're listening to the audio version, but there is an exclusive video version on my Patreon page. Every Creative Endeavor episode that I produce from here on out has got an exclusive video, and that's the only place to find it. And you'll find that link accompanying the description that goes with this episode. In addition to the video version of the podcast, I have exclusive Q&As and critiques and time lapses, as well as reference packs that I share with my patrons every single week. It's only five bucks a month. So if you want to show some support for this show, then uh, jump over to my Patreon page and check it out. I really appreciate it. Just a heads up, there's a slight audio glitch where my microphone was bugging out in the first part of this conversation. And I, I mean literally bugging out. It's still cicada season here in the Marlborough Sounds of New Zealand. So it's summer down here in the Southern Hemisphere and those cicadas are going absolutely bananas. So there's this constant hiss just for the first 15 and 20 minutes of my part of the audio. But for the most part, I'm letting Jeff talk. But when you hear me come in, you might hear that little bit of background noise. And I record these episodes over Zoom or Skype. So I apologize for that audio glitch. But bear with me, you'll still be able to hear clearly what we're both saying, but it does go away after a little while. Okay, sorry about that. I think I've just about cleared up that issue and the cicadas have already done their thing and they're off to better places. I really appreciate your understanding. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of your hair. Here's Jeff Hine and the Creative Endeavor. Jeff Hine. Welcome to the Creative Endeavor Podcast. What a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. Well, look, let's kick things off. Uh, People that listen to the show, they know I always like to start off things this way, but let's just kick things off here. I would love to hear about your story. I mean, you've got some amazing paintings in your portfolio, what I've been looking at on the website. I've been following you for ages on social media. How did this all start for you? Where did that art journey first begin and what was really inspiring you as you were taking those first steps along your uh, Hmm. artistic path? You know, I, uh, that's interesting. I mean, how far back do you want me to go here? Um, Birth. (laughs) Birth, okay. (laughs) 
Well, I, you know, it's funny. I just, I just took on this student who's 14 years old um, and she's filled up like a hundred sketchbooks already and they're unbelievable. And I think, man, that is not, I, I just, those kind of people just blow my mind because that is not, that it's not who I was. Um, in fact, when I was a kid, I always knew I could draw because when I was in school, I'd rather draw than pay attention, but that was the extent of my drawing. Um, I never drew at home. Um, I, I always just assumed go out and play, you know, whatever play was sports or whatever. Um, and so, and it was, I drew so little that when college came around, it was time to apply to college. I told my parents I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to major in art. And my mom kind of laughed and said, you don't even draw or paint. I'd never painted at that point. Um, and you know, and part of it was, <clears throat> part of it was too, I know this sounds really cliche, but we were really poor. <laughs> I mean, so we, there were seven of us, not seven kids, but five kids, two parents in a, in a 1200 square foot house. And my bedroom was a closet. So there was just no place for an easel anyway, even if I wanted to paint, but, um, but honestly, I probably wouldn't have anyway. I just wasn't into it, but I knew I could do it. And it always felt like who I was, if that makes any sense. Um, and so in fact, when I was in the ninth grade, I even had kind of a bummer experience where I had, uh, it was my first art class in the ninth grade in high school. And the, there, this guy sitting next to me was on the football team, this big old gruff dude, and he did not care about art. And the only reason I bring up the football team is so you can kind of get a picture in your mind. This guy was huge, total sports guy. I'm not into, not a creative person at all. And we had this assignment that we had to uh, do an ad. It was like a drawing advertising class. I was in the ninth grade, I think I mentioned. Um, and uh, we had to do this ad and it was of a car and we had to have a person standing next to the car. And then we just had to rule the text with just lines. And so I spent, this was my first class, first assignment. I was so excited to be in a drawing class and I spent so much time on it. I probably was up all night that night before on this thing and I made it as the best I could. And I was, I have a natural aptitude to this stuff. So it was pretty good for a ninth grader. And uh, I brought it in and this kid next to me, the football player, he just had a stick figure and he made a joke about how stupid the assignment was. Literally a stick figure and a box with, with two circles for wheels. That was his car. So a few days later, we got the, we got our grades back and he had a B plus and I had a B <laughs> and um, I was a very timid high school kid. So I went into, I worked up the courage and went into my teacher's office afterwards and very timidly said to her, why did so-and-so get a B plus? And I only got a B because I worked really hard on this and he didn't seem to really work very hard. She literally went off, like started literally yelling at me and said, you have some nerve thinking just because you have talent, you're supposed to get special treatment, blah, 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 went on and on and on. I was so freaked out that I immediately went to the guidance counselor, to my guidance counselor, went to the office and changed the class, never took an art class again until college. So that was my oh. one and only art experience until college. Oh yeah, it was brutal. I mean, that woman had some serious oh. issues. Um, oh. you know, and at the time I was so freaked out, but you know, now that I'm an adult, I know what was going on with her. I mean, she had some pen, pent up issues with, uh, insecurity or something. Um, but, well, but so what's with our teachers, by the way, <laughs> Sorry. I, well, I mean, certainly that doesn't re <laughs> represent all our teachers. For she sure, she was, sure. a, she was a one of a kind, but, yeah. but she, uh, anyway, but it turned me off. So I took, so I had to take requirements. I had to take an art requirement you know, art classes. So I would take like a film class or something. I never took drawing or painting in, again until college. So then I got to college and I was really nervous about it. I thought, man, when, you know, I know I'm good compared to my high school, you know, the kids in high school, but now this is like a real college and like, I'm in an art department now. These are all art majors. And I was super intimidated. And then I got there and I held my own and I was like, gave me some confidence. And I felt like, man, maybe I can do this thing. Um, so I spent a year in college and then I, I actually served a mission for my church, which was two years. And then I got cancer, which was another year and a half. So I didn't get back to college after that first year until I was 
23 years old, I think. Um, so I kind of took a really long road. So I didn't, so then when I was 23, I went, I'm, by this time I'm in Utah, I'm originally from New York. Um, and uh, I enrolled in a community college and, and then I took a year there and they told me that I should be at the university. Ironically, they said I was too advanced for the Salt Lake Community College. So they said, go to the university. And I had, they, and I got to the university and was really disappointed because the Salt Lake Community College teachers were better, but they're far too humble. Um, so ultimately I ended up dropping out of college and um, not on purpose, but I had a solo show that was actually a scholarship that I got, got from an independent donor who chose the, his favorite artist um, of that particular year and would grant them a scholarship to have a solo show. And that year he actually chose two of us. So we had a two man show, two person show. And um, after that show, I was, because my credits didn't line up right, I was still technically not a graduate. It was meant for a senior, but I was a senior, but I technically didn't graduate. But after that show, that summer, my career took off and I never went back to school, never got back to school. So um, I always intended to, and then, you know, it's been 20 years now, literally to the year. So oh, I don't wow. think I'm going to get a degree, looks like. Um, <laughs> But I've been, I was really fortunate. I just was, things just worked out for me. I, I, the, that show was lined up in a local gallery that just really did a lot of work to get my name out there. I mean, they really got on the phone. I think a lot of artists have the misfortune of just having, going into a gallery where they do nothing but hang it on the wall, you know? And I think that this dealer just got on the phone. Like, I mean, when I, there were times I bring a painting in there and I know I'd see him get on the phone as I was walking out of the gallery. And then, and then he'd come running after me and say, I just sold it. And I literally hadn't even gotten to my car yet. I mean, he was working so hard for me That's and it was awesome. a huge blessing. This guy's like 97 years old now. It, it's super sad. I wish we were still working together, but, um, and then another gallery, um, which is now, um, now out of business, they came to Utah at the time, right when I was graduating, Utah developed a reputation for grooming a lot of artists for some reason. And um, so galleries were actually scouting the state and this one gallery, it's actually Went Gallery. Um, some people might know them from back in the day. They came to Utah and were looking for artists and they found me and um, asked me to join their gallery. And they really helped me out a lot too. They ended up burning me pretty bad, but they helped me out a lot before that happened. So that's really it in a nutshell. Um, obviously there's a lot of things in between, but that's the, the, the short story. That's, that's, it's phenomenal to hear your story. I mean, there's so many things right there that we could just pick up. There's so many threads and there's a few things that I want to ask you though. Um, first of all, uh, really glad that you're here because that would have been really freaky. Um, you know, oh, you through, mean because of the cancer? Yeah, going through the yeah, going yeah. Through, through cancer, but you're you're obviously better, and and that was yeah. that would have thrown such a spanner in the work. So uh, I'm sorry to hear that, but really super stoked that you know you're better, right? Well, thank you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> wow. So yeah. so a few things I want to ask you about that because I I obviously you know I. I I reflect a lot of what you you said. I mean, my my story with dealing with you know school and galleries, it's it's very similar to yours in in many ways. But I, I'm I'm really curious about the art school experience because if there's one thing I get asked more than just about anything else, it's like, hey Andrew, you know you went to art school, I want to go to art school too, and I'm I'm always saying, hey look, art school is not necessarily art school. There's differences in the types of education that you're going to get, mm -hmm. and I went to a university to a tertiary institute institution and it was really modern really uh, kind of abstract contemporary stuff I didn't vibe with it at all I was trying to be something I wasn't and it took me a little while to recover from that experience consequently now I just say to people don't go to art school unless you can find an atelier or unless you can mm -hmm. find somebody like Jeff Hine to teach you you know you want to <laughs> you want to be doing something that's going to carry your skills and then you get to decide what you want to say with those skills as your tools and your tool belt but but get get the actual skill and get the knowledge yeah. there yeah. don't don't just go and learn how to be 
interesting in a conversation by throwing out a few esoteric words or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. because you know some obscure Korean artist who's you know, installation work involves crumpled bed sheets or look at the look at the latest project that they have. It's all about licking pavement. And and you know it's I feel it's, like you're not making these up. Dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. No, no. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Listen, the gigs are far too specific. Dude, if you can tape a banana to a wall and oh, that's taken if, if that's taken yeah. seriously, oh, come on. Okay, it's over. Mm -hmm. It's over. It's mm -hmm. a joke. And mm -hmm. and the people I think end up being the butt of the joke. It's like, what are they going to mm -hmm. fall for this time? So I, I just don't participate in it, but that's kind of the education I got. What, what yeah. did you find? Uh, take us back to those, those days when you were studying. Did you, did you feel a little bit like a fish out of water in, in that institution? Oh, I mean, I know, absolutely. I, I know you didn't get your degree, but I mean, I, you probably at this well, point I would never I was in school. back. I didn't get a degree, but I was in school a long time. I mean, I, uh, I can't remember the numbers, but I went to three schools and the first two didn't transfer to the third. Um, so I, I have enough credits for probably almost two bachelor's degrees and yet I still didn't get a bachelor's. It's just none of them transferred. So I was in school a long time. So I have a lot of experience with bad and good. Um, and you know, it, the, my first school was, uh, it was called Rick's College at the time. Now it's BYU, Idaho. And they were sort of this, this weird little school in, in, in uh, what's the name of the city now? Rexburg, Idaho. It, it's just like out in the middle of nowhere. And they had these gems of teachers. Like, what, why are they in Rexburg, Idaho? These great teachers. The teacher I studied with was uh, Griffin. His name, um, I'm, I'm losing his first name now but his last name was griffin professor griffin and he was just insanely difficult and insanely motivating and very talented particularly for a kid with no experience you know i look at it back now i still think he's talented but at the time i was starstruck you know um because i'd never seen anyone draw as well as this teacher being a 17 year old with no experience um and then again i don't want to demean what he's doing he's still a great he, he is, he is and was a great draftsman, but at the time I was just absolutely starstruck. Right. Um, but he was, he was me. <laughs> he was mean in a funny way where he would really just rip students apart. You know, like he'd come up behind them and say, aren't you embarrassed of that? Like, that is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Or he'd say, and, and so you're majoring in art. Why? I mean, he was just so demeaning. No, no. Yeah, but you know what? And but here's the thing he did that I loved, which was the exact antithesis to this teacher that I dealt with in the ninth grade. Maybe it's because of this ninth grade teacher that I, I really this resonated with me. I mean, maybe I'm giving her too much credit that she's even thinking this much about it. But but you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this mentality of every great everyone so that everyone's feelings aren't hurt. Like make sure everyone, it, particularly in the arts, make sure everyone leaves class feeling warm and fuzzy. And I mean, it, it's almost beyond grading on effort. It's, it's uh, grading on emotions, you know? Um, and I'm, and this guy was an absolute grade on quality and success, not effort and certainly not feelings, right? And so if you did a bad drawing, it didn't matter if you worked on it for a month, it didn't matter. It was still a bad drawing, you know, it's, and to me that resonated because, you know, if I got a bad grade in my history class, it didn't matter if I read the textbook six times, I still failed. So why are other students getting better grades than me when I'm doing better work in the art class, right? So this guy, he was, he took the quote unquote best student in the class, gave them an A plus, and then graded everyone down from them. They were the standard by which he graded everybody else. And um, between his insults and his grading um, philosophy, I was so unbelievably motivated in his class. Like I am going to be that A plus student and there's no one who's gonna stop me. I mean, it was, I was absolutely determined to be the A plus. And also when he insulted me, I was absolutely determined to make him eat his words, right? It just, and some people don't thrive in those situations, but for me, he was the perfect style of teacher. Like every time he insulted me, I got more and more pissed and wanted to prove him wrong, you know? So it was excellent. And I've, awesome. I've stayed in touch with That's him so a little awesome. bit 
because he was just, uh, I mean, he's not a well-known artist at all, but he was just the perfect teacher for me. Um, I'll never forget it. And I, I've told him, thank you a thousand times. He probably gets annoyed with me because it's been 25 years, but, um, but then I had, when I went to the community college, I had a few really good teachers there. Um, but then, like I said, it was only one semester and then they, or maybe two quarters. And then they told me to move on. And then I went to the university of Utah and it was just a bunch of frou-frou, like, you know, like you described, just how can we express ourselves and, and without substance, without craftsmanship, without, you know, it's simply nothing more than content. In fact, we had a final exam one year in one of my classes, that was a drawing class. And in that final, we had to do a drawing and then bring it in framed and then do a presentation on the drawing in front of the whole class. And, um, again, my, it's my personality to try hard, you know, that's, I'm, I'm that way. I want to do well. So I worked all night. And at the time, my wife and I, we were married pretty young and poor, and we lived in one bedroom, not one bedroom apartment, but one bedroom of a basement of a friend of ours. And so I'm working next to the bed while she's trying to sleep and she's not happy about it. She's begging me to turn off the light and it's one o'clock and then it's two o'clock and then it's 3 a.m. And I'm getting more and more tired and starting to make irrational decisions. So I was doing a figure drawing and it wasn't going well and it's early in the morning. So I start cutting pieces off of it. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, but it's, it's like, this isn't the only time this has happened to me where I start doing irrational things because I'm tired or whatever. But so I start cutting things off of it. Next thing you know, the only thing that's left on this thing, it started out like 20, uh, 24 by 36. By the time I'm done at 3 a.m., it's about three by three inches. I have cut it down to nothing. It's confetti. And you know what's left? It's just the butt crack. That's all it is. It looks like a Y. That's <laughs> just the, just a Y. So I'm like, I am so screwed. This is the final. It's like half my grade. And um, so I brought it in the next day. I bring it into this class before this is the one. And one of my classmates who shares both classes starts laughing at me. And he goes, and you didn't even frame it. You are so screwed. And I'm like, dude, dude I'm going to BS my way out of this. You just watch. So I go into the next class. Again, it's not framed. It's just a loose piece of paper. And it's time for me to get up in front of the whole class and give a speech. These are grown up, grown ups, by the way, 18 and older, right? These aren't just little kids. I'm fooling here. So I knew my audience. So I came up with some concept of some political issue that related to the female butt crack at the time. I don't know what, <laughs> this is 20 some years ago. I figured out a way to tie it in. And then I talked about some fragility of something and that's why I didn't frame it. And I got a standing ovation from the class. The teacher stood up, he shook my hand and he said, that is the best art piece we have ever seen in my entire career. And I got an A plus. And from that point on, I just stopped doing it. I just, so what I started doing from that point on was just BSing through all the assignments and getting good grades for the first time because I was playing the game. And then I'd go home and I'd give myself real assignments. I'd look, I'd open up books of, of great painters and try and figure out what they were doing with my own assignments. And, you know, like one time I brought a rubber ducky to a sculpture class and I, I gave up, gave some long story about what the rubber ducky meant to me. And I got an A plus. I didn't even sculpt it. It was just a rubber ducky off my shower. Um, but I, you know, I did tie a bandana around it. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. I mean, it was a tiny little bandana. My wife told me not to do it. She said it was unethical. And I said, Jen, it's not unethical if they believe it. You know, I mean, I've been, I've been to the Jeff Koons exhibits. I saw the vacuum cleaner. How is my rubber ducky any less of art than his vacuum cleaner? Don't get me started you know? on Karen's. Please don't get me started <laughs> on Karen's. But she told me it was unethical. I'm like, I'm sorry, Jen. If they believe it's art, that's yeah. the art world. And that's yeah. the game we're playing. So I got an A plus in that. And I just, that's so I started amazing. teaching myself. And, you know, and it's great because it's not great. But what came from it is uh, that I have a huge uh, library in my mind and on video and in writing of assignments that work for me that I use on my own students now um, or that I give to my own students. So, and you mentioned, you said something that I use a 
a phrase that I use all the time. It took me a while to recover, you said, from my schooling. I have said that so many times. It took me, it took me years to recover because even though I knew that I was learning a lot of ridiculous things, um, it's hard sometimes to know just how much they s- stick. You know, like I, I remember eight years after leaving school, I was working on a painting and uh, I made a stroke a certain way and it looked better than I'd been doing before. And it occurred to me that I hadn't done it before because I was told in college that it was wrong to do it that way. Um, My teacher in college said, you should never touch a stroke again. You put it down and you leave it alone, which could not be more, I mean, it could, that is completely the opposite of how I approach painting now, but it took eight years to discover that he was just stating opinion Mm. and not, not fact. Um, so, I, I would I would love to get yeah. into how you approach painting now. We'll we'll, we'll I want to geek out about the technical stuff, but but yeah. I, I'm just going to say on, on on that note, you and me, we we ought to start right now an online group, uh, Art Graduates Anonymous uh, recovery program. <laughs> yes, okay? seriously. Just uh, just, uh, just uh, oh, you know. Shoot. Hi, my name's Andrew, and I'm a recovering uh, art graduate. And oh, uh, that's I, too funny. I have I have a bunch of really bad ideas. Um, I, I remember though, like just, it, it was, it was probably a good year for me where I was just going, who am I? And what am I doing? I, I got out of the university program and then I was trying to work out, trying to make art, real art. And, and I, and for some reason, it's like, there's this idea because something's been done before and, and they, they threw out this thing as just a kind of like a just a throwaway line as a way to just denigrate an entire genre but they just said oh you're you're just painting cows and gum trees cows and gum trees and and in an australia with the heidelberg school it's um cows and gum trees is all about uh, you know th- th- those quintessential australian landscapes that federation type landscape so it had already been done it's kind of like you're uh, in the U.S., it would be the Hudson River School. In 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 Canada, it'd be a Group of Seven. Although they kind of got it weird in some places. Um, in the U.K., it might have been the, the Victorians or, or whatever, or Impressionists or whatever. So so this is this is a a knee jerk reaction to that coming out. It's like no, it's been done before. It was done by the Heidelberg School. But I'm like, hang on a second. No, this I remember at the time being in university, going, no, this matters to me. I, I really love this stuff. I want to. I want to do this, and it's like, but you can't do that because that's already been said. But now I, I'm just in a in the position where it's like, well, I don't care. I, you got to paint for you, I, and and I just decided it took took me a long time to just go. I want to paint a landscape, and that's okay. I don't have yeah. to yeah. tear it in half and sprinkle it with hundreds of thousands, and then you know get the fire extinguisher out, and you know. I don't, I don't have to do anything weird and wonderful. It's fine. Uh, you know, just doing what right. you want to do. I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly not an expert at this, but it seems really obvious to me, but maybe it was the 1950s ish, maybe forties was the last original time for anything. Um, art, music, clothing. Like, I mean, people are having, people have mullets right now from the eighties. I mean, it, yeah. it's like, and then I, when I, I was, swear, I swore that was never going to come back. It's no, back. I know, but it's back, but, uh, but that never used to happen. That never used to happen pre 19th or 20th century, 21st yeah. century. We have literally run out of ideas. And so everything is recycling. When I was a kid, I listened to listen to my father's music was an absolute joke. I mean, he was listening to the Oak Ridge boys and I was listening to the violent femmes or the Pesh mode. Right. It's like, but now I listen to the same music as my kids because it's it's the same stuff that I listened to back in. They li- they literally like Depeche Mode. Like I'm like because their music doesn't sound that much different anymore, and that's the way painting has become. Where it's, it's like the schools they want you to do something different, but there's nothing left to do. The only thing that there is left to do is to is to stop thinking about doing something so different. You know, mm. <laughs> it's. There really isn't. I mean, once you've once you've displayed a urinal, you're out of ideas, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. So that that's that doesn't mean that there can't be uniqueness mm. in art, because just like you and I, I mean, there's what seven billion people. I don't even know how many people are there in the world now. Are we up to eight yet? 
anyway, there's a, there's billions of people in the world hmm. and yet we all have a different face. I mean, how hard is it to find someone that looks just like us? It's, it's impossible. So, and I believe that we also have a different way of making marks. We have a very subtle, um, we each have a subtle aesthetic. Uh, we have our own tastes. So we don't, I don't think we have to set our work on fire and then urinate on it in order to be different. All we have to do is just be ourselves, you know, it's like, and, and yeah, art school was certainly didn't see things that way. Um, and that, you know, when I teach, that's the number one thing I, not the number one, but that's one of the big things I try and pound home into my students. And, and also that I make an effort to stay out of the way of my students and that I don't want to take away their natural personal aesthetic. Um, because I think that we all have our own way of seeing the world. We have our own way of making marks. We have our own way of walking. We have our own way of moving. We have our own mannerisms and that translates in, translates into our art. So I feel so strongly about that, that when I teach, I, I'm very careful to stay out of their way. So I never say, make a mark like this. I never say your brushstroke should look like that. Or, you know, it's whatever, all I care about is that you get, that you are looking at value, hue, chroma, shape, proportion, and so on and so forth. As how you do it, I don't care if you put the brush between your toes or you paint with it stuck in your ear. Um, it really doesn't matter to me. And, to, and that's what's going to make each of my students unique is just being able to maintain their own way of moving and their own way of mark making. And it's been really interesting because I've been teaching for, let me see, 20 years, I guess, privately. And I've never had two students look the same, like never in 20 years. In fact, I've never had, well, I can't say never. I did have one copycat. But other than one copycat, which was deliberate, um, I've never had one student look like me in 20 years. Not a single one. Um, and so when you when you say copycat, was that somebody who attended your class and then took your techniques and just ripped them off and was a mini? Well, they Jeff literally Hines? were copying paintings. They were literally copying paintings. They oh, wow. they they weren't just copying my way of painting. They were literally copying painting and then selling it. So it was an it was a con yeah. I'm not oh, under wow. my name under their own name, but it was wow. a conscious effort to copy me. It wasn't like I had taught them to paint like me, right? They were. They took, a, they took a few classes and then went off and started selling work that they were copying off the internet that looked just like mine. Um, but that's a whole different thing, you know, and we don't need to get into that. But as far oh, as- Oh, because I, <laughs> I, I, I'm always, no, look, man, I tell you what, like if a doorway opens, I want to walk through it, but, but I don't, I don't yeah, want to yeah. get caught in the weeds either. I'm always so curious to hear about how people deal with copycats because I've had a few of those. Uh, I, I'll give you an example. I had a website it, it, in China. You could go onto this website, right? It was a Chinese website and you could, uh, you could order your Andrew Tischler at any size and they were ripping stuff oh, off yeah. my website. You could just order whatever painting uh, and, and we, we shut them down, but it was, I, I didn't have the presence of mind at the time to go ahead and order one. Cause I was thinking what a time saving exercise. I, I, I imagine the amount of work I could get done. If I just had a dozen people working for me, making my paintings, this is great. Seriously. Right. You know, just outsource. No, I had that happen to me too. Yeah. Oh man. Straight up. Yeah. It, it, it burned. Uh, and then I had somebody who was really, and I'm not going to mention their name, uh, very well known and still very well known, uh, take one of my paintings and straight up reproduce part of it for a cover of one of the books that they had made. And, oh, and, ouch. and, and I, I got in touch with him and the, 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 the really thing that really burned about it was he was a childhood hero of mine. And I oh. just, I just emailed him and I said, dude, straight up, love your work. And I emailed him a picture of my painting and then a picture of his book cover. I'm just like, Oh, it just got oh, me, dude. No, it got hurts. me. And it's just one of my yeah. heroes just came from there, just crashing down. Like, and then I started seeing examples of that everywhere else. But everybody loves this guy. Uh, no, I'm not going to mention the name. And don't even guess if you're listening. No, to I'm this, not going to guess. No, no, you're like, oh, but people are listening. Going, yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll be in the comments going, I, I think I don't know. You don't. You won't have <laughs> any idea who it is. But um, it, it's it's always interesting because that's out there, right? And and now with yeah. the internet and images being all around, it's the opportunities for that happening are are everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's. You know, and I actually, I got enough copycats that that 
that's the reason I stop. I completely switched my style. Well, that's not the only reason. There were a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I completely switched my style back in 2007 was because it was too easy to copy. I'm like, I'm getting frustrated with this. Um, but also I was ready to move on, you know, but, I, but it was definitely one of the things that influenced a decision. Um, but yeah, anyway, this, this artist, uh, I wish I could say I handled it well. I was young and hot tempered at the time. So I probably didn't handle it with very much grace. I probably handle it a little better today, but, um, you know, it turns out I've learned from experience that it doesn't hurt you that much. <laughs> when I was young and I was scared and I was just trying to make my way in the world. If someone copied me, it freaked me out. Like they were going to ruin my career and everything. But, um, as I've gotten older and I've been doing this for a while, I realized that, you know, we're not that fragile, you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. you hear your whole life, starving artist, starving artist, starving artist. And then right, right. after 20 years of painting, I don't feel as fragile as I did when I was completely, you know, hammered with that stereotype as a student. Um, so, um, I think I'd handle it differently now, but at the time, yeah, no, it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't handle it very well. <laughs> when did that, did you ever adopt that persona of starving artists? I mean, I, I, so I hear from your story that you struggled early on and it was very much, uh, a, you know, a, there were trials there. Um, a lot of artists go through that, you know? Um, yeah. but, but what tends to happen, I think with a lot of people and, and, and culturally it's just out there that that the starving artist is a thing, but I, I found now that Look, it doesn't have to be that way. There, there, there's no. there, there, the amount of artists I talk to. There's a different, completely different story there. But what's really interesting about this podcast, as well as people can hear how many different avenues to success there are, and this idea of starving artists is a myth. Yeah, you know, some people choose to do that. Yeah, and they, they they can, but it, but it's an absolute myth. There are opportunities everywhere. So, how long did it take, or what what was the thing that allowed you to just click out of that mode? and find your feet and start moving towards. Cause look, I, I don't, I'm just going to assume from the outside looking in, dude, I, I am super inspired by you. The, the website looks great. I know you, you've started your courses with Sentient Academy, you know, you're, you're teaching. Um, I, I'm just going to say, I would love to do some teaching course, promise not to copy. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love <laughs> to do some, some, uh, some teaching and hear about, you know, the way you do things. Cause I think you're up there with, with some of the best portrait artists working. Oh, um, so, so how, I guess how did you how did you find your feet here? How did you how did you click into that? Mode? Um, you know, I don't. I I'm thinking about myself here, so I'm not struggling with words as much as I am just thinking back and looking at myself from outside. Um, and if I look at myself, my younger self from the outside, I'd have to describe myself as stupid confident. You know. I wouldn't, I was, I definitely had insecurities and I always will. I mean, I don't think, I think even the most competent people can have insecurities, but I never, it never, I never thought I'd fail. Like, I just always knew I would be an artist. I don't know what, it, where it comes from. Um, my parents literally begged me not to study art, literally begged. Um, I remember one time my mom, I was newly married um, I'd already, I was well into school. I sold a painting for $200. And my mom said, who in their right mind would spend $200 on a painting? And I said to my mom, I know, can you believe that? Like I said, we're lower middle class, you know, she just didn't get it. And I said, uh, mom, people spend tens of thousands on paintings. Little, did, little did I know they spend millions on paintings. I was even naive, right? I said, mom, people spend tens of thousands on painting. And she goes, oh, Jeff, don't be so naive. <laughs> And it was, wow. it was literally within that year that I sold a painting for 35 grand and my mom Dude. begged, I'm not lying. <laughs> oh, and my well mom done. begged for my forgiveness wow. and I love her to death. She always yeah. wanted what was best for me. Both my parents did. Sure. It was not sure. obviously not right. She just didn't know, but she begged for my, she's like, Jeff, I could have ruined your life. I could have ruined your life. But I was, I think I was really fortunate to just have, uh, just have this feeling that it was going to work out. And I don't know where it came from. I really can't. Cause I mean, I knew the stereotype, but I always had this sort of bite me attitude. Um, you know, it might've been just where I came from. I mean, I was a, a very religious, um, uh, Mormon kid in upstate. 
in New York, just outside New York City. And I spent my whole life being ridiculed and told what I wasn't and what I should be, you know. So I just developed this bite me attitude. Um, and I think that I, <laughs> the only thing I can guess is that it sort of applied to my career. People were just like, you can never make it. And I'm like, well, bite me, I'll make it, you know. Um, but wow. I don't know. I mean, it's hard yeah. to really analyze yeah. yourself. But, mm. and I was really lucky. I think that confidence served me well because I never really did have a starving period. I think I, when I, when I finished that scholarship or when I had that one man show, I was still a student. And by the end of that year, my wife quit her job and I was supporting our family. Um, so it happened really fast for me. I was really fortunate um, and lucky. And, you know, and I tell students, I know that there are talented people that don't make it because, so I want to preface this next statement with that. I know there are exceptions to this, so I don't want to be insensitive, right? Um, there are talented everything that don't make it in their chosen field, right? For whatever reason. And the thing is, there's a lot more than being a painter and making it in this field. I mean, if you're shy as all get out and you never leave your studio, you're not going to make it even if you're Michelangelo, right? So there are other, there are other things, but um, I always tell my students because they're all afraid and they buy into that stereotype, right? I say to them, um, well, let's put it this way. If every person who's ever put on a Band-Aid and read a few uh, health magazines and claimed they were interested in medicine and could call themselves a doctor, then we'd have a stereotype starving doctor, right? But that's the problem is the artist is the artist. That term is the most overused, underrated <laughs> word in the English language, you know? It's like, if you draw a picture, it doesn't matter how good it is, people call you an artist. And so, of course, there are starving artists. Of course, there are millions of starving artists, you know, because it's the one thing that you can be called and not actually be in our society. You know, I've been painting for 20 years, and I still don't know if I'm an artist, right? That's for history really? to decide. And yet, wow. And yet, I know four-year-olds that think they're artists, right? Right. Right. It's just, uh, that's, you know, if you look up in the dictionary, one of the definitions, it's been a while since I've read it, but one of the definitions is someone who's a master of their craft. So to say you're an artist is to make that claim, you're a master of your craft. And so um, it is an overly used word, right? And everyone's an artist. So therefore, we're going to have a lot of starving artists. But I fully believe that those who have truly mastered their craft tend to do pretty well in this field. Um, but they're not as common. They're not that common, right? People who really, really master mm. the craft. That's not common. It's hard to do. It, it is very hard to do. And let, let me yeah. ask you about that word, because that's a word that I struggle with personally is, is master. Because look, I, I read the YouTube comments, and I got a lot of very sweet people following me, very kind people, and they're telling me stuff that I don't deserve. Um, yeah, I know. Same is, here. It, it just, and they're, and, and a lot of them mean it. They're very genuine, and it just blows me away. It floors me. And it just, to me, it just means like, Andrew, you've got to show up with everything you've got. And yeah. I, I, I tend to respond, you know, for the most part, just say, oh, well, look, thank you very much. I don't want to get, I don't want to just shut down what they're saying. You know, they, they feel moved by what they're watching or whatever. I'm super grateful for that. But there are people out there like, oh, Andrew, you know, you've mastered this thing. Dude, I am so far from mastery. I know like within myself, there's so much to know. Once you gain a little bit of knowledge, I heard this analogy once and it's a bit like a light in a dark room that knowledge is like this where, where you know, if it's just a tiny little light, the periphery is that uh, of the known and the unknown is, is very small and tight with just a little bit of knowledge, but the bigger it gets, the bigger the boundary of the known and unknown is. So that, that, that unknown part becomes so much bigger. So the more, you know, the more unknown there is. And I you know just, it's ridiculous. You, you suddenly realize and frustrating. That there, there's no end to it. Hey, eh? there, I mean, there's no end to it. And so I'm looking at this going, man, it, but now that, that used to depress me, but now I, I'm thinking, I hope I never get to the end of this because this experience of learning about it is cool. So let me ask you, like, yeah. so, because I, I look at, okay, but right now, for instance, I, I, got, I got your website open up in this other tab and I'm, I'm clicking through some images while we're talking here. 
this portrait of the little girl. Uh, is that your daughter? Which Actually, one? Which one is uh, that? Beautiful. I wish I could turn the screen. I don't see a well, title just, on yeah, that. Describe it. Uh, it's about fifth image in and a little girl, probably about seven or eight years old, uh, charcoal drawing charcoal on paper, 16 by 12 inches. Um, stunning, mm. dude. Stunning. Oh, I don't even remember which one that is, but yeah. Well, it's probably uh, not my daughter. I don't think I have a charcoal of my daughter online. I, I, I'm looking at it just going, I, 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 that's charcoal. That's, that's nuts, dude. That's Isn't it weird nuts. that you can make pictures out of dirt? <laughs> yeah, straight it up blows my mind. Straight up, you know. Yeah, I was, so I was talking. Weird. I was talking to Christopher Remmers about this, saying, you know, it, yeah. it's the most primitive thing you can imagine. It's like you're pushing colored mud around on a bit of cloth with a stick with some hair yeah. sticking to the end of it. It's so primitive. We haven't it's so bizarre, dude. We've yeah. all, we haven't come very much further than the caves of chewing up ochre in our mouth, putting our hand up on the cave wall and going. <laughs> you know and and, but, and, it, and just how well it works particularly with oil yeah, painting man. it's such a primitive medium and yet it's yeah. like there's nothing like it yeah. nothing nothing like it so so yeah. how are you, how are you finding well, this journey uh, towards towards mastery well <laughs> you know I, I just mentioned i don't even know if i'm an artist so therefore yeah, i don't yeah. even know if i've mastered it exactly you know? so so i'd have to put a giant quotes around that term but um but i think that anyone who has mastered it is going to be successful. And then there are those who like myself, who I don't know if I have, who are, you know, good enough to have made it, right? So, um, you know, I, I agree with you. It's like, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know, right? I remember when I was in, uh, again, when I was newly married and in college, I remember doing a portrait of my wife in graphite. <laughs> and this is some of that stupid confidence that I had. And I just thought I was the greatest thing ever. I was drawn, I drew that thing and I'm like, dang, man, that looks just like her. And it did look like her, but I look back at that portrait. It's in my basement right now. And uh, every now and then when I'm moving stuff around, I'm like, oh, there it is. And I, and it's so much less advanced than what I'm doing now. And yet I hate my drawings now. And I thought I was God's gift to drawing back then, you know? And now I'm like, oh, Oh, I wish I could draw better, you know? Um, and like you said, it's a, it's a, maybe you didn't put it quite this way, but what I gathered from what you said is it's a kind of a blessing because, you know, that it motivates you, knowing you don't know motivates you to learn. And uh, we've all met those artists that think they've got it all and therefore they never move on. They never move forward because they, they, they can't be taught, right? Um, and you never want to fall into that trap. But the downside of that is you never love what you do. You know, you might get fleeting moments where you're like, oh, that's not bad, right? But um, if you love what you do too much, you don't want to improve. Um, so it's a love-hate relationship that I have with, with striving for mastery. Sometimes I wish I was content with what I already have, but then I would never grow, you know? So exactly. um, yeah, it's quite the journey. <laughs> I, I love, you know, um, I love the doing, you know, not necessarily yeah. what I do, but just the act of doing it. I, that that's where I try to put my focus to be actively engaged in, 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 in the making of the thing, whether it's a drawing or a painting or maybe a digital, whatever, um, uh, getting caught up in the process. I think that's where my jam is now. Um, oh, that's if I, funny. if I fixate on the actual end product, I, I tear my hair out because I, dude, I'm looking at my drawings, just going, Oh, I suck. <laughs> I, I oh, guess and then it's like the next one, the next one, the next one, you know? So yeah. I, I, I try to just focus on, no, I am drawing. Therefore it's cool. And I'm going to learn something and I'm going to apply it to the next one. Just focus on the doing, you know, but that's just, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I mentioned earlier that I didn't draw much as a kid and it's interesting because I'm, I envy people like you because I don't really enjoy the doing that much. Um, wow. Really? No, I really don't. I, I mean, okay. I have my moments, but let, okay, let me, let me rephrase that. I like the overall lifestyle. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade my life for any other life. Right. Okay. I like the overall lifestyle. I, I do want to get to work on, on Monday and, and work, but I don't want to paint every day. Like I need some variation, like, right. Okay. Um, and some, some artists just crave it. And I'm just like, oh, I'm bored. I just want to get on. I just want to get this thing done but I'm motivated enough to do it well that I just suffer through it. 
um, because so I want. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, my okay. main motivation is the accomplishment, not the process. And I'm kind of envy people that really enjoy the process. Um, and I'm that way with everything. I have lots of hobbies, and it's always about the end product. It's like uh, I, it's um, I guess I'm a materialistic person. I want the thing at the end of the path more than I enjoy the path. Um, even if I'm selling that thing and I'm not going to get yeah. to keep it, there's something about the fulfillment of having created the thing mm -hmm. that is more that I crave more than I crave the experience along the way. Oh, so wow. yeah, it's strange. I know. Yeah. But I wish I had that more, but I, I, I heard that once with a, with a guy that was a, you know, a, a hero of mine. And he even put there in his artist statement that he hated to paint. He did just could not stand painting, but he had to do it. And he was great. He was, he was, he was, yeah, that's me. He was a dynamite painter, but yeah, he just kept showing up because it's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to get this. And look, I'm not going to say that always I'm enjoying the process, but it's, it's, it does take work. I'm curious though. So if you're like this with other hobbies, uh, what, what are some of those other hobbies that you have? Um, Cause oh, I'm always, man, I'm so distracted. No, no, I love this because I, I, I don't just paint and make videos and stuff online. There's other stuff I love to do, but I, I I'm curious to hear about what other artists you're into. Well, so there's a shot of the studio a little bit. You can see there's, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's lots of equipment. Yeah, there. man. Yeah, yeah. I've got in this studio, I've got a wood shop, a metal shop, a leather shop. I've got oh, seven dude. sewing machines. <laughs> I've got Far out. Uh, everything you can imagine. It's like Santa's workshop. Um, That's um, awesome. Like Sean Cheatham, awesome. I like to make knives. Um, I like doing all kinds of metal work mm -hmm. and then woodworking and and lots of stuff i do electronics i've got my whole studio all pimped out with weird little electronic devices to make things easier that's um, so cool yeah i'm very distracted person and you know i've made tons of different i like i like engineering things i've got very unique easel contraptions and other unique tools in here that our other artists don't have um and it's just uh, you know, I really, I lack his genius, but I relate to Da Vinci in that he struggled to get anything done <laughs> because he was always yeah. doing other things. You know, that's me. Dirt. Like I, Dirt. yeah, I'm always distracted. Yeah. <laughs> always. This morning I woke up and I know I had to start a painting today and I was put looking in my sketchbook and I'm like, you know, I could make a better sketchbook than this. I think that's what I'll do today. You know? And I know I need to be painting today, but so I decided wow. maybe I'll make a new leather sketchbook with, with a way to, a different way to hold my tools. I didn't do that because I ended up on the phone all day, but that's, that's typically what ends up happening with me. And, and, and now you're spending time with us here on no, the it's cool. it's podcast. A, it's an honor so, and a pleasure. Uh, oh man. No, the pleasure's yeah. all mine. Seriously. That is so interesting. So because I, I actually, I do remember scenes now that you mention it, I remember seeing stuff on your Instagram where you were made a couple of posts about some other stuff. Weren't you tricking out your van or like you were doing oh, something? Man, I love your... my van. Yeah. Dude, that like van that, that so was cool. bad ass. So tell me about oh. that. Is this, is this an art van that you're kind of traveling yeah. around? Oh, okay. Tell me all about it. This van, I wish I could put it, I could show it somewhere. Like there was a way to show it because I'm so proud of it, but it took me, I'm I think I'm done with it. My, it's a kind of the running joke in my family that I'm, all, I'm never done with it. But um, it took me full time about nine months and then just working on it here and there for the rest of the time. And it's, uh, I think I, the last thing I did on it was about the two year mark. Um, but, and I put a lot of time and money into that, but I did everything um, in it from the electronics, the plumbing, building the cabinets. I did all kinds of fiberglass work. Um, everything but it's like a van like you've never seen because it's got all this custom fiberglass in it so it looks like a car instead of instead so there's curves in it instead of like you typically see when someone builds out a van it looks like a house on wheels right this i wanted to make it still look like a vehicle so it's got curves um but anyway it's uh the reason i made it is because like i said i wanted to start landscape painting but when i had cancer i lost most of my intestines so I can't really go out on my own very much for health reasons. So I, because I can't just leave my easel and then have it be stolen, you know, if I have an emergency. So 
don't want to get into too much detail, but um, so I've never been able to plain air paint, you know, um, and I really wanted to learn to plain air paint and, and experience being outside. So I just made basically a camper, not a camper, but a, a studio on wheels with all the comforts of home in it so that I can just pull over somewhere and plain air paint, you know, and not have to worry about any of those health, health issues. So that's, that's it's, amazing. I man. love it. I love it. They, they um, say that I used it a lot last year. They say necessity is a mother of invention, don't they? You know, and that's, yeah, uh, it is, it is, it is. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So, so, so you, okay. So you've been taking it out now and, and you've gotten some use out of it for, with the plein air. Yeah. A, I've a probably little. done 30 or 40 paintings out of it. Um, I that's haven't fantastic. this winter much, but um, yeah, it's been great. I love it. That that's awesome, man. And and I've I've got to ask you this. Uh, I'm I'm getting addicted to sketchbooks. I've just got this the sketchbooks I, you buy off the shelf, right? I, mm -hmm, please, mm -hmm. please. You're probably going to be like Sean Cheatham, and you're going to want two thousand dollars per you know sketchbook or knife. Like I, I, I when I had <laughs> when I had Sean Cheatham on the podcast, right? I was saying, dude, that palette knife was so good. Like, what would you it's sell so that cool. for? And he's like, he's like, oh, I'm probably not going to sell it. I'm like, no, it's like, well, what would you want? He said, oh, I probably have to get there. I can't remember what he said, but it was, it was ridiculous. And fair enough too. It's a handmade palette. Oh, there's so much bulk. work. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, wasn't it's it like, Damascus too? Yeah. yeah it wasn't it Damascus? The, I think yeah, so. It just it had ridiculous. this beautiful marble pattern. I was yeah. just looking at it going, that is the coolest dang palette knife I've ever seen. But um, what do, do you, do you make sketchbooks for other artists? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't afford to. Yeah, so the one, you, yeah. so you should go to my Instagram, Jeff Hines Studio. Okay. That's where, because you, you know how finicky Instagram is. If you post yeah, anything man. that's not paintings, you drop like a thousand followers overnight. So yeah, I, yeah. I opened a new account that's Jeff Hines Studio, which is all my little inventions and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't post on it very often, so you're not going to see a ton of stuff. But I think uh, I've got a bunch of stuff, a few things on there that I've made. But like the sketchbook I use now, um, well, the one, I, the main one that I use took me like 40 hours to make. And it's like $400 worth of materials. I mean, it's wow. a pretty fancy thing. <laughs> it's a, it's a passion Dang. project. It's not, it's not lucrative. I, would, I, I could never make money on it. I'd have to sell it for a Dude, fortune. Dude, if I, if I ever had one of those, I would never draw on it. Cause I could never think of anything good enough to put on those pages. Be like, well, oh, I ruined it. I ruined this book. Oh man. Well, that's crap. part of the brilliance of this. Not, not, <laughs> not, not saying I'm brilliant, but that's part of the, what's cool about this is like, it's uh, it's not technically a sketch book. It, the one I'm talking about is a sketch case mm -hmm. where you open it up and it's got an easel like thing inside it. And then when you open up the easel, there's loose paper behind it. And so nice. I can carry all kinds of loose paper. And then on the other side is a magnetized piece where all of my, all of my tools stick to it so that I can sit it on my lap and nothing falls off my lap. And, uh, so that way it's never too precious. I just keep putting new paper in it. And then sure. I can, in, I used to always get frustrated too because I'd start a new sketchbook and then I'm like, yeah, but I want to work on tone paper today. And I've got this white sketchbook with whatever. So that was one of the reasons I came up with this. Mm -hmm. um, but the other reason is I hate when I ruin a sketchbook. I'm one of those people that if I do one bad drawing, I never want to look at the sketchbook again. I, I'm yeah. just not very good at yeah, uh, being kind to myself in that way. Straight so. up, me too. I, I I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll be going along. And I remember once I had I was came up with some ideas for some stupid YouTube merch, like really dumb merch. Um, and just a heads up, folks, that there's so, <laughs> this stuff is so dumb. I just came up with the most. I've got like a really dumb sense of humor. And um, do you remember the? Uh, I, I don't know if you ever remember this meme, but uh, there was a guy who was out the front of a gym. And uh, he was going to like some beefcakes, some absolutely ginormous dudes. And you just look at him and go, do you even lift, bro? Do you even, do you even lift? <laughs> and these guys were just going insane. Just going, what'd you say? Like, what'd you say to my face? Like, look at you, man. Your arms are spaghetti. Do you even lift, bro? And it became this thing. And um, now... <laughs> I, if you're listening to this, so do you podcast, do a thing with, do you even paint? <laughs> no, you can't steal this. If you're listening to this podcast, you, it's already a thing now. It's already a thing and it's coming. Like, do you even paint, bro? Do you even sketch, bro? And then another one, like, 
<laughs> I, I, I often to my Patreon people, I refer to myself in the third person because um, <laughs> it's so dumb. It's hilarious. But I, I'm the Tish. And, <laughs> and I've got this I've got this hat coming that says, do you even Tish, bro? Um, oh, no. So I, I, I started. So you're I, going through with this. Oh, dude, I'm going all the way. It's got to be. It's like, <laughs> you're not selling it very well. <laughs> I, but the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. Like I'll make a dumb joke in a YouTube video and I'll tell my editor, it's like, do you want, you want to cut that out? I'm like, no, it stays. Cause I, I, I'm just cracking myself up over here, I, but that's me. That's just, I've got a dumb oh, man, sense of humor. Funny. But the thing is, is that I, I started sketching up these stupid little graphics and logos and stuff in, in my good sketchbook. Like you're going, oh, nice little barn. That's really cool. And there was even some stuff that was even, you know, a little bit spiritual where I kind of put the cross on a barn and then I had like 12 sheep and I was doing like a little, a little graphite study for something that I wanted to do that was kind of biblical. And then, then the next page you turn it over and it's like, do you even tish bro? I'm like, come on, dude, I'm not touching the sketchbook ever again. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's, oh, that's <laughs> classic. Yeah, but, um, man, it's that, that's so cool, man. Like thinking of these, these hacks, uh, and ways that make your artistic walk a little bit easier. I love that. I love well, that. you know, the other cool thing about it is this is, I'm going to, I'm going to totally throw him under the bus, but, um, do but it. Do if, it. if you ever hear this, James Gurney, you kind of had it coming to you, but he drew me a couple times at the Portrait Society of America, America um, conference and they're freaking cool drawings. And it's like, I mean, come on. I mean, if he draws you, you're going to want that. I mean, it's James Gurney for crying out loud. So of course I go over to him and I want it. And and what does he say? He's like, oh, I'm sorry, it's in my sketchbook. I can't really take it out. And I'm like, come on, I'll pay you any amount of money. He's like, no, I'm sorry, it's in my sketchbook. And he did that like three times because he's drawn me like three or four times. And um, it kills me. I'm like, just give me the drawing. I'll cut it for you. You'll never even notice. And he's like, no, I can't do it. It's in my sketchbook. So wow. that's, and, and Thanks, for Jax. me, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't sell a lot of drawings, but that's the other thing is occasionally someone will want a drawing. And I have to rip up, rip up a sketchbook. I've got one, one of my favorite sketchbooks. It's just torn to bits because of, because it had to be unbound to get some drawings out of it. And so I'm just like, I, from now on, loose leaf paper, no more sketchbooks for me. And so that's another reason I wanted wow. to make something like that. I, I'm doing now more and more, like I've got the sketch endeavor, sketch endeavor series that I've yeah. started on YouTube and, and more and more I'm doing those like loose, quick sketches in just cheaper books. Cause I'm like, no, I'm not going to get precious with this thing. I, so I think it'd be that loose leaf. That's a great way kind of uh, around that. Yeah. I can see. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, I'd love to find something. I was talking to Joe Paquette about some toned paper sketchbooks, and I'm thinking about getting some of those because I'm I'm loving the toned paper. But anyway, look, look, I I, I just we can geek out about that. What I really want to want to ask you about, right? So you you've you've got this style. Uh, let's let's get a bit technical here with the painting and the drawing. Tell me. Tell me a little bit more about your approach uh, to the portrait from a technical point of view. Because again, I'm looking at this, you use color and texture and impasto and, and it, it, there's a real sculptural quality to it. And then it's loose, it feathers out beautifully towards the edges of some of these pieces. Tell me about your approach to the, to the portrait. And I'd also really love to hear about your decisions about who to paint. Because I, I just want to throw this one thing in there that mm -hmm. I get a lot of people. So there, there's people that follow through the private Facebook page that's associated with my Patreon, or they'll show me some of their work, maybe on social media or whatever. The amount of celebrity portraits I'm seeing, I'm just like, hey, who's around you? Who do you know? Oh, it's just my family <laughs> or whatever. You need to draw and paint your family. Like, straight yeah, really. Up. Like, don't, don't, don't go draw on the Joker or or Angelina Jolie, this has been done. Just go and paint who really matters to you, like in your immediate circle. I, I'm imagining that's who you're painting. That's people you, you know, right? Well, that one you pointed out was one of my apprentices. He's, wow. he's older than me, but I have apprentices from 16 to 65. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he just, one of, their, one of the deals that they make when they study with me is they have to be willing to, pour, to pose for me. <laughs> but he actually ended up buying that one. Um, so yeah, I paint my friends. You know, um, I'm drawn to older women, which is weird. Um, you know, a lot of artists that I admire paint beautiful women. 
um, like Casey Barr, or Jeremy Lipking and various other people. And it's, yeah, yeah. and I know it's great market because they sell like hotcakes, but mm. I just, for some reason, I'm, dr I'm drawn to the character and the, and the shapes and the forms of older skin and, yeah, and then man. the women, I, I mean, I like older people in general um, because of that, but I, I mean, you know, maybe it's because I'm a man, I prefer painting women, but um, I don't know. I probably read into my psyche a little bit there, but, um, but I also find them, I find that if I hang a man in my house, I'm going to get eaten alive by all the feminists out there, but um, I find if I hang a man in my house, it's a little more intimidating, a little more threatening, right? There's okay. something to me a little more calming about a, a portrait of a woman. Um, so well, let, let me let me just add this then, uh, because I, I got to say there's there's a certain power and grace to this painting that you've done of Judith, which is the first one you'll see in your portfolio. Yeah, yeah. Now, for people watching the video version of the podcast um, exclusively on Patreon, uh, then you'll you'll see I'm going to cut in here an image of this painting uh, with with Jeff's permission here. But this or this portrait is is absolutely exquisite, and there is she's beautiful like I mean, okay look look not not to take away from casey barr or or, or lip king or no they're any, amazing any, any, yeah. they're amazing <laughs> dudes and amazing painters but i i get that totally there's a market for that but you know you're you're authentically going after this thing that is is touching something in you you can see that exploration there there's there's a truth and a power that's coming through on the canvas man it's it's really it's oh, so it's so good so i'm drawn to that as well like i i mean i've got a crusty old dude sitting right there in my studio and that's um that's russell mm -hmm. petherbridge from yandoid a sculptor um wearing an unironed shirt uh I, I there's something about that man i was just like yeah i gotta paint this that's so cool mm -hmm. like it's not he's not you know but uh, to me that they're beautiful people the old people are beautiful they are people. i love the painting story. the wrinkles and the folding oh, skin man. it's just so interesting yeah yeah. And I think, you know, people who paint beautiful women and men, young people, that is, could be equally authentic. It's just not what I'm drawn to as a painting subject. Um, so not usually. I love painting my kids when I do religious paintings, putting them in paintings. Um, you know, I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to the mood I'm in in that particular day as well. But I feel like mm. you asked a question and I got way off base on it, though. <laughs> Dude, uh, th this is this is a this, this is a series of dirt roads in the middle of nowhere. This <laughs> yes. is this is a uh, this yeah. is the podcast. Welcome. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, look, I let me ask you, seeing as as you went there just now, though, with with religious paintings. Um, so you you would consider yourself a so you're a Christian, right? You're a, yeah yeah okay. So me too. Uh, and and mm -hmm. I've often um, thought about this, like, because I do want to do a series of, of biblical paintings. How do you approach that subject? And, and what no, are some of the themes there hard. that are really, that are important to you? What are you exploring there? What are some of the things that, that go through your mind as an artist? Well, you know, to other Christians, this might make a lot of sense to some people, maybe not. But for me, I've found that if I'm not doing something um that's bigger than myself on occasion that i'm just not happy you know um because being an artist is a really selfish career like everyone wants to know what you're thinking what you're feeling and what you're inspired to do um and it's just uh it's a kind of a me 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 lifestyle you know oh i don't feel like painting today well you're not supposed to paint when you're not inspired, you know, where everyone else is just slaving at work. They got to get up at seven. They got to get to work. Right. Um, so for me, it keeps me grounded to do something that's more meaningful and that's bigger than myself. And that's part of the reason I'm drawn to the religious subject matter. The other reason I'm drawn to it is because it's like the stories are just, it's a story that that meet not only is it meaningful but it's content that i couldn't create on my own um and still communicate with a broader audience right so if i were to come up with a narrative myself no one would understand it but this is a narrative that that's meaningful to me that that teaches me something but it's also meaningful to millions and millions of other people in the world um and i can we sh it's a common language 
that we share, which I think is pretty awesome. So it's a yeah. subject matter that it's hard not to be interested in for me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much drama in the stories. I mean, I'm always tempted to do the most dramatic stories in the, in, in the Bible and, you know, but some of them I'm also afraid to do, which is why I haven't done a lot of them because they're very intimidating. I mean, they're so complex oh, like right man. now. I'm working on the crucifixion. I've put that off for 20 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's tough. Like it's heavy stuff. If, especially if you believe it, like I do, mm -hmm. like uh, you don't want to screw this thing up. <laughs> It's not like I'm going to go to hell if I screw it up, but you know, it's meaningful. Like I want to do my, I want to do my best work right on something that's uh, so meaningful to me. Um, you know, and if I'm just painting a friend, yeah, that's, that's a friend and that's meaningful too, but it's not the same. It doesn't have the same emotional weight. Um, and so they're intimidating to do. And this particular painting is like 13 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Christ is stands about eight feet tall on the cross. I mean, the cross is, more than eight feet but he's from head to toe eight feet tall so it's bigger than life and uh man it's an intimidating painting to to approach from day to day that's so, amazing and and yeah. what i'll do uh for the podcast is i'll cut in here your painting triumphal entrance um 2016 this painting there is so much going on like let alone the, the perspective and the architecture i mean good night i i, I dude i'd love to hear technically how you oh, went about this, this. painting so, was a nightmare uh, so for the for the people listening to this i'll just i'll describe what we're looking at um it would so it's a, it's a scene of 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 jesus entering on on a donkey and there are all these figures everywhere and we are taking a view almost as if we're seated here uh, right here in the foreground, there's a woman who's turning around to look at us. We're at almost her eye level. So you've got this subtle perspective shift where you're looking up at the figures that are standing. They diminish off into space, but then you've got this triumphal arch with the Corinthian capitals on top of the, this building. Dude, the perspective alone, the stonework, the, and every individual character with expressions on, yeah, like this is a portrait of portrait. But dude, there, there's like, how many how many figures in here? Like 64, 60? There's about 50. Oh, dude. I think there's 49. I just oh, missed wow. the 50 mark. But if you, if you lump all the pigeons together, that equals one person. So we'll say 50. <laughs> we'll say 50. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and beautifully well painted, I've got to say as well, like they, they just add another spark of life. Then you've got, you know, the figure up on the the balcony throwing the the lilies down uh the palm fronds like the whole the light in it come on man so oh, tell man, me i'm glad you like it tell me it about this tough. i love that it a... i know i well look i try to do ambitious stuff not like this, <laughs> this well it was nuts, more ambitious man. than you probably realize because it was yeah. all done from life or imagination so wow. there's no photo reference at all and it took me two oh, years wow. um see i it, for 13 years i never work from photos at all. Um, back in 2008, I decided, I realized I was plateauing in my, in my painting skills. And so I theorized that if I added resistance, I'd build strength. Um, and it, well, it, that theory proved to be true. There's no doubt. I don't regret it wow. at all. Um, wow. so I took the next 13 years and never used a photo. Um, and man, it was tough. I had some tough times trying to create 50 figure paintings with donkeys and pigeons without photos. But um, it was so the like the building, I had to build that in miniature. And then the perspective drawing alone took three weeks, drawing it on paper. And then I had to project it onto the eight foot canvas and not project with a projector, but like I had to redraw it on an eight foot canvas. Okay. But why? Okay. Let me ask you though, if it's your drawing, why not project it with a projector? Jeff? Because it would distort it. I mean, you go through all that effort and that's a, that's a valid point. And I probably wouldn't have an, you know, wow. ethical quotes, okay. ethical <laughs> reason to not do that because I already drew it, yeah, but yeah. It, yeah, it would slightly bend the lines more okay. than likely. Uh, okay. And and you'd yep. be surprised when you blow something up that, and when you go through all that effort to make a perfect mathematically accurate perspective drawing, mm -hmm. if you're off by millimeters, it screws up everything. So mm. it wasn't an option. I had to redraw okay. it. The reason I didn't originally draw it on the canvas is because I frankly needed, I didn't know what it was going to entail. So I didn't want to, you know, run into all these problems on an eight foot canvas. I, I wanted to figure out the problems first and then go at it 
with a lot more knowledge on the big canvas. Um, but then I kept referring back to that perspective drawing to figure out what size each figure was in space. So I'd have to, every time I added a figure, I'd invite a new model in, I'd figure out where they were in the space, calculate their size, blow it up six times onto the canvas. Um, and they had to be literally down to the millimeter and standing in the right place or it wouldn't work. And then, you know, um, it was, it was, tedious the donkey i had to go to a donkey sculpt it bring it back light the sculpture oh, man. um the birds <laughs> same thing um the birds I actually caught from a sears parking lot i tried i i trapped them and then <laughs> <laughs> i let them go though so all you pita nuts out there don't worry okay okay, okay. no pigeons um, were hurt in the making of this no painting. no they weren't no they were happy pigeons um but uh yeah <laughs> We went through a lot of crazy stuff and man, pigeons are rats with wings, man. They were nasty, but um, yeah, it was, we went through a lot of wow. effort. I say we, because my assistants would hold the pigeons while I painted them, you know, um, but the donkey I couldn't bring in. So I had to go to the donkey and sculpt it and then bring the sculpture back in and light it and then kind of improvise on putting Jesus on it. And, you know, it was, it was really a major Frankenstein project, just bits and pieces, Frankensteining everything together. And I, it's hard for me to appreciate because I, I see, you know how it is. I see all of my tracks. I know exactly how it was done. And so I overanalyze it, but, um, but it, was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of work. And now COVID forced me to start working from photography again because no one would model for me or could model for me. Wow. Yeah. And so, and you know, and I'm 47 years old now, and I feel like I've learned what I'm going to learn from working from life for 13 years. Okay. So I'm actually really embracing kind of moving back into photography and just like mm. chilling out a little bit. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And painting is hard with no matter how you do it. But I will say that it has been a huge blessing to implement photography again, <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, it's, doing all of that preliminary work and dealing with moving models and children and moving animals and stuff. It's exhausting. It is oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. exhausting. Um, so who, I, who's, who's commissioning these works or how do you, no, that's, or is it just all personal projects that you just really would love to do? Is, it, is that every now and then my church will commission one. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them are personal. And then I end up selling them privately, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah. So my awesome. church is, uh, they own about four or five of my paintings. That's about it. Wow, man. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I just want to make mention of another one. Just, you know, uh, again, I, lo I love the story, um, you know, like you love Jesus, but just from a painting point of view, just from a technical point of view, this anointing at Bethany 2018, dude, like that, you, you knocked it out of the park with that painting. Just, oh, thanks. I, I, I want people to see that from just a just the quality of the light and the contrast and the way that composition works. It's just beautiful. Um, I appreciate that. Tell me about that project. So again, uh, life models. I, I got to just say on, on a side note, wow, what, a, what an incredible challenge to set for yourself and go, you know, I, I'm not going to learn. Uh, I'm not going to use photo reference. Like did you, even though you might be changing, you've changed your policy now, but you know, for the time, that's really interesting because I've always really relied on it quite heavily for just about everything. But the other thing I tried to do was own that reference and not and and not feel bound by it, but you know, use it. Right. Just go go what I call off script. So whenever I say I'm going off script, it means I've got my initial seed of an idea or something because, and then I found reference to support it. But I it won't be from one photo. It'll be there'll be, it'll change it up a bit. I'll use like a little bit of that tree. I like the way the light's hitting that bark, or I like something about this over here. So I'll, I'll, I'll very much take that Frankenstein approach in a way uh, when it comes to using reference, but man, what a challenge to set yourself. I, I, I imagine that that pressure uh, does build that resilience in an artistic way. That's, that's awesome, man. It does. You know, and the thing, the hardest part is the drawing aspect um, because well, you know, well, let me backtrack a little. So one of the things I discovered, which a lot of people don't realize, particularly when you're going for multi-figure painting, not, so, not always for a portrait, but for me personally, also for a portrait. 
and I can get into that when we talk more about, you mentioned my color and everything. Um, we can talk more about that. But even from life, um, I don't follow the script, so to speak, right? Um, I rarely copy even from life. The only, what I copy are exact proportions because I want a likeness, but it's, I'm always taking liberties in light and color and, and things. So, but when you deal with multi-figure, then you're putting someone in a studio, but they're supposed to be standing outside, right? And they're supposed to be standing next to someone else, which means that they're going to get reflected light from another person, but there's only them standing in there. And then it's like, there's all these other components that aren't in, that aren't present, right? Um, so you're never even working from life with a complex painting like that. You're never painting what you see. You're always drawing what you see, but you're never painting what you see. So, so it, yeah, it's, there's, it's a lot of improv, painting improv. Um, but the thing that really, I think the, the two things, um, there are two ways that I grew the most with doing this for 13 years. One is my drawing skills, because you have to draw fast when you're working from animals and children that move, right? You have to be fast and accurate. The first time I drew a child from life for one of these complex paintings, um, um, I was almost in tears because they would not hold still at all. It happened to be my daughter. She would not hold still. And people say things like, why don't you make them watch TV or why don't you have them do this? And I'm like, no one really gets it. Like you can't have a kid watch TV because then they get this zoned out look on their face, right? And it's, it's not natural. And, and half the time in a multi-figure pain, you want them to be acting in some form, right? You want them to look a certain way. So there is no way around it, but just to say, hold this pose the way I'm asking you to hold it. So what I found myself doing was drawing for 10 seconds, giving them a five minute break, drawing for 10 seconds, giving them a five minute break. And in the five minutes, I'm drawing from memory, right? And then they come back for 10 seconds and I fix everything that I remembered wrong, you know? So you learn a lot about drawing when you're drawing under those conditions. Um, what, 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 and what, so now, what, what, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, ow, 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 my brain just short circuit. <laughs> you're drawing for 10 seconds. Did I hear that right? 10 seconds and then a five minute break. Yeah. Well, look at maybe I'm exaggerating. It might be 30 wow. seconds, it, okay. less than a minute. You know, it might be 30 seconds. Oh, it dude. depends on the person, but look at and take that painting that you've mentioned with the, the, um, oh, now I'm forgetting my own title. The, the one with uh, triumphal entry, excuse me. Yeah, tri triumphal entry. Um, yeah, yeah, you yeah. take that painting and look at all the people holding their arms in the air and smiling and laughing and everything else. They can't hold those poses, right? So they do it for as long as they can. And then I work from memory for a while. Then they'll do it for a few minutes and then I'll, then I'll work from memory for a while. Um, and then with the kids, it's even worse, right? So you take my son who's up on top of that guy's head with his hands on his head like that. So he was sitting on top of uh, a mannequin and then supported by ropes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't hold that for more than five seconds at a time. He, he'd constantly be complaining, this, that, and the other. So you kind of have to work from memory a lot. So now when I'm drawing from a real person that actually holds still in a classroom type environment, it's, it's like, or from a photograph, it's like, this, this is too much. I mean, this is like, this is a gift, you know? Um, so I learned a lot. It was really boot camp for drawing. But the other thing is just being exposed to accurate, accurate lighting, accurate color, what real, what real flesh and, and what real flesh is supposed to look like and the way light really behaves before it's seen through the lens of a camera, right? And that's all I looked at for 13 years. So I feel like that's always hopefully going to stick with me now that I'm using photography more. I'll still work from life too, but now that I'm using photography more, I think that uh, hopefully that'll stick with me and really inform my work. Um, I'm a true believer because I worked from photography for quite a few years before I did this. And I don't believe that uh, working from life is superior. In fact, I think some of the greatest painters who ever lived were in the 19th century and none of them, Waterhouse, Eakins, um, none of them worked from life. <laughs> you know, they all worked from photography. Um, that's really so interesting think, because there was yeah. there was uh, daguerreotypes at the time, or if I'm pronouncing yeah. that right, and that there not many people actually realized that that a lot of these these painters from that period of time they were they were even sharing photo reference, 
you know, yeah. amongst themselves, like, and, and you'd see images come up in, in multiple paintings by different artists, but that's, that's a fascinating period of time. L let me ask you, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. sorry to cut you mm -hmm. off, but I, 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 I'm looking more and I'm just totally geeking out here about, you know, even some of these family portraits, there seems to be a real Rockwell vibe in some of them, uh, the family ones, <laughs> but, but mm -hmm. what, who are, who are some of your hero artists? Who are some of the people that you're, you're really, that you, you hold in high esteem? Uh, let me ask you this way. I've asked a few people this. It's always fascinating. Who's on your Mount Rushmore of art heroes from the past? Oh man, that's always the hardest question because there's so many. Um, there's tons, right? Well, I mentioned one of them, and that's Waterhouse. Yeah, um, Rembrandt. I studied him for a long time. Uh, that just the way Rembrandt could describe form. I mean, his figures just came right off the canvas. You know, I don't love everything that every artist does, right? You know, Rembrandt was sort of a clumsy draftsman. I'm gonna get hung alive for that one, but. Um, but his paintings were, oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever painted as good as he, he did, but um, who else of dead artists? Uh, Solomon J. Solomon. Um, I don't know. There's so many, there's so many that I really like. Um, I, I didn't know who that was until really quite like just a few days ago. I'm ashamed. Oh, no kidding. Dude, I, I, I saw an original, but I never twigged that that, um, that was, uh, and I'll, I'll see if I can put it into the podcast here of me in front of this painting by Solomon J. Solomon. I can't even remember the title, but it's it, the original is, is in New Zealand of the guy uh, carrying the girl down from the plinth. I can't remember the name. The title. No, I don't remember. Oh, I know the painting, but yeah. you know, you know, it's massive. Dude, it really? is huge. Oh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering right, it's hanging in Auckland, New Zealand, the original. Really? Stunning. Stunning. I've never seen an original. I would love to see an original one of his yeah. paintings. But I, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't put the name to it. But he, it, what an amazing painter! Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, my favorite period is the nineteenth century. I mean, they had. I mean, the advent of the camera really changed things. I mean, all of a sudden, every figure was precisely drawn. I mean, in that you mentioned daguerreotype, they had they what they did in the nineteenth century was the best of both worlds. What cameras do is they take the drawing problem out of the equation. Like you still need to know how to draw, right? But you don't have the problems of figuring out how to draw a baby or figuring out how to, you know, I mean, remember all the big headed, weird adult looking babies from before the camera. Um, yeah. You don't have to yeah. worry about drawing a <laughs> smile. You know, although Velasquez did a great smile. Um, he did a few paintings with people smiling that are mind blowing, but the camera made it so that 19th century painters could just almost capture people in motion, everyday, real life people. Mm. Um, mm. But they didn't have color. So they still had to rely on real life for color. And that, that to me is the best of both worlds, right? And so the 19th century to me is the, that's just the best of the best. They did some great work in that period. I think today, the difficulty is to, and you you talked about this, the difficulty is to move past the photo because now the photo is getting so good, it, it's tempting to not just copy the photo, right? It's so good. And so you see lots of paintings that are photos. They're, they're photos. Um, and, I, and ironically, sometimes a, a painter will paint a photo to look like a photo and then they'll do prints of the painting that look like the photo. So now you have a photo of a painting that looks like a photo and they sell the photo of the painting that looks like a photo. <laughs> <laughs> it's like like photo it's a photo bizarre kind of, yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so oh, it's wow. and i'm not being critical i'm just saying it's tempting it's like because now our reference is almost too good right i mean with digital mm. cameras and mm. and hdr photography and how we can really broaden a dynamic range beyond what we ever could even 15 years ago it's like mm. it's so good now um that i think it's our job as artists to uh, really move, make it something else, right? Make our paintings paintings, make them something else. And that's, that's hard to do. I, I'm going to, I'm going to bring up another painting here um, that is just stunning. Um, the Johnson's 2009. Oh, I love that one. That's one oh, of my favorites. Man, it is so good. It is so good. This little boy moving the marble, looking back towards the viewer, that startled look on the daughter's face. 
uh, the, the older boy leaning in going, okay, what are you doing, bucko? You know, this is <laughs> the, 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 the energy here, the, tell me about that painting. So, so here are, are your, your, again, I'm assuming you're going to be doing a lot of this stuff from life, but how do you know? Okay. Okay. I'll so I'll be honest with you. Okay. These aren't from life. Okay. No, okay. these aren't from life. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, you, so you most see- of these were done before I made the change, made the switch. Most of these were done uh, previous to 2008. Wow. Um, or this one might have been later, but this woman was from Hawaii and she didn't have the ability to stay mm-hmm. to do it from life because her family is from Hawaii. Um, so yeah, so that one is definitely, I can't remember when, does it have a date on it? I think it was 2009. 2008. 2009. Oh, 2009. You've got yeah. here. No, that but... one was done from photos. So, um, but you had mentioned earlier that, you know, you see a Norman Rockwell vibe, but what's really interesting is it's actually Wayne Tebow. That was my main influence back then. Wayne Tebow. Okay. That's yeah. a new one you... for me. That's a new one for me. You don't know okay. Wayne Tebow? Uh, no, I'm really no, showing my up. ignorance here. He just here. passed yeah. away. Oh, oh, he just okay. passed oh. away. Okay. He's the one who's, uh, he was a pop artist. I don't know. I still don't know why they call him a pop artist. He was of that period, but he, he did the cakes in the bakery windows. They would always have like really blue shadows. Um, Tebow's really hard to spell. Don't ask me how to spell T- it. T-H-I-E. T-H-I-E. B-A-U-D. T-H-I-E. Tebow. Tebow. I would never. There you go. Thebowed. <laughs> yeah. Wine Tebow. Okay. <laughs> That's really, I would never be able to spell it. So I was looking at Wayne Tebow really when I started doing paintings like that. And I loved the way, I mean, obviously mine are different and uh, people don't make that connection. But what I liked was the graphic quality of his paintings, the way it was the subject and the subject alone. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and then and then the rest of the painting was about design. So he'd paint mm-hmm. these cakes and then he would design the he would he would use the shadows as part of the design element. And if you notice in, in some of these figurative uh, portraits, then I really have fun with the shadows and, and creating, I did it differently than he did because his was very, uh, very much about color. I mean, mine are too, but his shadows were very much about exaggerating color mm-hmm. and long fluid strokes where mine are really graphic and uh, much more about shape. But I was right. definitely influenced by him. And I probably was influenced by Norman Rockwell because I am a fan, but I didn't know it. <laughs> but how do you, I mean, I think so many people have said it, it has to be true, right? I don't, I, but I didn't know it at the time when I started painting these family portraits, I had no idea if that is the case, but you know, we don't live in a bubble, right? And sometimes yeah. we don't even know who we're being influenced by. And I am without a doubt a fan of Norman Rockwell. So well, I, I, I tell you what yeah. though, like, I, you know, because Ro- Norman Rockwell, like, okay, so uh, just a giant, uh, you know, in, in painting terms, amazing work. And I, I'm still really influenced by him, although I don't paint like him at all. But I, there, there's a certain truth to what he he did that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that authenticity and that truth comes through when you're when you're actually over the target. And, and this I, I love your approach to the family portrait because this is I imagine a lot of these are commissioned and yeah all I, of them I, are. I, I I just I turn them all down I get asked all the time can you no no I'm not oh, I'm not I love them I'm not paying I'll you take them but but now I'm looking at it going it's so so how are you doing this and again I want people if you're listening to this podcast and you're not watching the the video version of the podcast exclusively on Patreon. Uh, if you're if you're <laughs> listening to the audio version, then uh, go to Jeff Hines' uh, website, jeffhine.com. Look at the portfolio and under the family portraits tab, you're going to see some beautiful portraits. We've got bus stop. We've got who's the boss. I love that. Look at the dart in the middle of her forehead. That's hilarious. The riches. <laughs> so, so how do you go about this process? Because this, this is fun. This is imagination. This is, so they, they obviously, once you start doing a few of these people are like, I won't get Jeff Hine to paint our family portrait. Yeah. I've been really fortunate. Look how funny he makes it. This is great. So, so tell me about this process. How how do you, you had mentioned this sense of your weird sense of humor. Well, I I feel like I'm sort of the same way. And, you know, and we'd also talked about religious art and how meaningful it is. And so Family portraits have also been a meaningful thing to me because when I, my family, 
is the most important thing on this planet to me, you know, my kids and my wife. And, um, and so when I see other families and the joy that they have, it's sort of like, I don't know, it, it just feels good to, to be part of that and to capture that in paint. Um, I know it sounds really corny, but sorry, that's how it is. So um, the sad thing is total tangent. I haven't done my family yet and my kids are 18 and I got to get on it, but um, wow. my twins are 18. But anyway, so I've always gravitated toward family portraits as well. And, but in the beginning of my career, I was told that family portraits were for, for the gestures who come in the back door and leave through the back door. Like they're not, they're, they're for low class artists, right? Cause they're commissions and you're told what to do. I was told this by another artist who I admired at the time. And so I rejected them for a long time too, but then my gallery, the one I had mentioned earlier that worked so hard for me, they kept calling me and saying, these people wanted to do these portraits. And the reason why is because I was doing these non-commissioned figurative paintings, which I think are also on my website, the older ones. And people were visualizing their family in those positions, in those paintings. And they thought I, it would be interesting. And so they were inquiring and I kept turning them down. And uh, again, this was all like in the first year of my career. And then my dealer is like, you, do you have any idea what kind of work you're turning away? And you've got a family. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm doing fine. It's all good. You know? And anyway, eventually he got me thinking, maybe I'll give it a shot. But because I felt comfortable where I was in my career and financially and everything, I went into it with a real, like, this is how it's going to be attitude, my way or the highway kind of attitude. And so my first portrait, I said, look, I will choose the concept, I will choose the clothing, I will choose the composition, pay me half down. If you don't like it, I'll keep it in the painting. If you do, then you pay me the rest and I'll deliver the painting. And they took it. So that's how I've run it ever since. Um, and frankly, I oh, yeah. think they like it Brilliant. better that way. You know, awesome. um, I don't know. I think they don't want to be involved. They want to know they're hiring a professional that is better at their job than they would be, right? Um, uh, and so, hang you on know, a someone that, that, that right there, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to keep cutting you off, Jeff, but I, you're just, <laughs> you're hitting these pain points for me that like, I, I just told my agent, I'm like commissions of clothes. I, I I'm not doing this and, and I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> but he's like, <laughs> and he's, he, he came to me and I, and I apologize to him right now. Cause he might be listening to this episode. He's like, you're making it very difficult for me, Andrew. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, he's like, so try got, this, try yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I mean, we, we've got a similar process of, of taking a deposit non-refundable, but you know, they could transfer it to another painting for sure. But I, I like, I, there was a project that just came through and it, he, I, I said, no, I'm not doing it. And he's like, think about it. Think about it. <laughs> This is, he called me a couple of days later. He's like, so what about the project? I said, I'm still not doing it. I'm just, I'm, but I don't know, man. I don't know. I like your approach to this because you're taking something that's so personal and unique that's outside of the norm for so many artists and you're owning it. You're owning it. It's like, like you, you, you want to get your family painted by Jeff Hine because look what he does with it. It's amazing, dude. Well, and I will turn down commissions. If someone comes to me sure. and they seem like a high maintenance client, I'll turn them down in a heartbeat. If they're like, hey, I've got these pictures of my grandparents. This happens all the time. Pictures of my dead grandparents I want you to paint. I'll say, no, sorry, I'm not interested. Or they'll come and say, I, I want you to paint, you know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'll say, well, no, I didn't have it. It's not something I've thought about. I'll, maybe if I do it someday, you can buy it, but not interested. Because I want to paint religious paintings that I want to paint. Right. So, and it's for sure. so for sure. I will turn stuff down if they tell me what to paint. Right. But with a family portrait, they don't. They, they, the way it's set up, the way I've set it up is they just say, here is my family. And, and that's the end of it. Right. And so, and because I like family, I'm good with that. I mean, I, a <laughs> family is a family. Right. So I'm good with that. It's almost like saying, here is the Bible. Now you choose, right? Um, it, that would be the same if it were a religious piece. Um, they're not saying, here is my family. I want them in my backyard. I want them all wearing pink dresses. I want da 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 No, they're saying, here's my family, go. So what I do is then I just interview all of them about each other. 
actually I interviewed a commissioner is about everyone else. So if the mom and dad are commissioning the family, I'll interview the mom about the whole family and the dad, and I'll interview the dad about the whole family and the mom. And then um, I take that information and I come up with a narrative and then um, I present the narrative to them. And this is the point where they can reject it. I'm not unreasonable, right? That's awesome. I present the narrative to them in a tiny little sketch, like a two by two thing in my sketchbook and say, here it is. And I describe the concept to them. I've never had anyone turn me down, Um, but they could if they wanted to, I suppose. And then what I would do at that point is just do it again, right? Um, but at that point, and then, and then once I, once they've, uh, approved the sketch, then what I do is I go to their home and they walk me from room to room and I go through their clothes and I pick out clothes that'll work for the composition. And I start laying their clothes out on their living room floor and designing the composition based on the sketch. I design the colors and the values on their living room floor with the clothes. And then when it's all done i say bring these clothes with you next week we'll do the shoot and then they come in and we and we do the the shoot and then that's how it works so yeah it's it's a blast that's so, and so cool. i like that one with the wow. dart on the forehead yeah i did the interview but what i've noticed was wasn't what this concept came well, not from the interview but from my exposure to them in their home um actually not in their home they're from nashville but in my studio um where it was clear that that little boy was in charge, right? And then the girl in the blue was like a second mom to the little boy. And she was like super trying to take control. She felt it was, it, to me, it seemed like that girl was like, okay, this kid's out of control. Let me take control of this kid, you know? But in reality, he still controlled the family. Um, and the dad, he awesome. was a workaholic. And he, and he was always in his own world and he always had these index cards and was always taking notes while everyone else was going on with their business, you know? So the, the dart is symbolic of the kid saying, Hey, you know what? You're not in charge of me. (laughs) You're not my second mom. And here's a dart in the forehead to show you, you know, it's symbolic (laughs) of his power. Right. And that's why he's on the one side of the canvas, having all of that presence while the rest of the family is on the other side. Um, so I, you know, it's just fun to see the family dynamics and come up with unique concepts. The other one you mentioned was bus stop. That one was the girl, they, her nickname was squirrel because she was a space case. They said they don't, they, they all agreed. And she did too, that she was a daydreamer, which I can relate to on the same oh, way. Wow. Yeah. So I put the squirrel in there, um, getting into lipstick in order to provide a distraction for her and also to symbolize her nickname but then have the mom talking to her and have her not listening, but being distracted by the thing that represents her nickname because she's always distracted. So, um, and then there's some other little things in there that describe their family dynamics as well, but wow, that's right. the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. And they're, they're super fun to do. And most people, well, everyone so, so far has been really happy with them. So that's what a great, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, for the video version of the podcast, I've, I've cut some of these paintings in here so people can, can, can enjoy uh, these. Uh, they're just stunning. One, one more here um, that is just a, 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 an insane piece, dude. Consumed 2010 oil on canvas, oh, 96 yeah. by 72 inches, people. Yeah, yeah. that was brutal. What? No, no kidding. Painted from life, I'm <laughs> going to assume. Yeah, uh, painted from life, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, the, so so describe what we're looking at here. Well, I'll tell you one thing. The setup for that took me yeah. about several weeks. So oh, I had to build a, basically a wall, Yeah. but it was about 12 inches thick. And then, um, and then I laid several layers of chicken wire stretched through the wall Wow! Um, so that I could layer the still life. Because if you just do one layer, it's not, it, it just doesn't have presence, right? It's just mm-hmm. all surface. So there's actually layers of objects. Um, so then I just worked from the back forward. But what was difficult about it was as you design it, you had to take things down to move things in the back and put things back in the front. So, um, and then everything's just kind of wired to the, big contraption. Um, but I, I, what I did was I sent out an email to all of my friends and clients and said, bring your vices, bring everything that you have to me so that I can put it in this still life. And it was during the 2008 recession 
which I don't know. You're in New Zealand, correct? Yeah. So I, I don't know yeah, how, yeah. The, how you fared out there, but in, in America, well, it was I, pretty I was, bad. I was in Australia at the time when that hit. Oh, uh, okay. That, yeah. Yeah. I, I moved to New Zealand in 2017 from Australia. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was during that recession. And so we had bought a home and, uh, I have always been really responsible with money and everything and bought well below my means when we bought our house. And then all of a sudden, everything that we owned was going down in value. And I was really irritated by society and everyone's blaming the banks. And I'm thinking, why the hell did you buy a house you couldn't afford? Are you too stupid? You know, I mean, because I remember when I went to the banks, they said, why are you buying a house that's this much? If you do this, this and this, you can get a house that's twice as big. And I said to them, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to get in over my head. So then the recession comes and everyone's blaming the banks. And I'm just like, no, this is a societal problem. You people all let them give you more money than you could afford to take, you know? And so this painting was me venting for six months about the materialism of the world. And I know it's me being too uh, preachy here, but um, I know we all have our issues, but <laughs> But at the time I was so stressed out about that the art market was falling apart and everything was a mess, you know? And um, so that's what that painting was about. Mm. Fortunately, yeah. I never got, I never suffered too much from the recession, but I was afraid that I would. And this painting shows that. I mean, my experience painting this reflected that because um, I was very stressed out when I was painting it. Um, but fortunately, I took a sabbatical to learn how to paint from life and differently in 2008 to 2011. So coincidentally, it had nothing to do with the recession. And so I literally was living on savings anyway from 2008 to 2011. So I completely dodged a recession. And then when I got back from the recession, it was this was the first painting I did post sabbatical. And, um, and then that one sold and things were fine. So I stressed for nothing. But that was my that was my piece to vent the <laughs> societal greed and materialism that I that I perceived right or wrong at the time. I mean, this painting is just it really does reflect that man. It's it's so I mean, not just I, I appreciate it purely from a technical point of view. But I see I, I it's almost like a um, you know, when you're looking at a painting, you're, you're, you you reflect something of yourself in there. I mean, all of us have closet that looks like this, you know, or of stuff mm -hmm. that we just don't want to get rid of or throw away or stuff that we've consumed or whatever. I, I, I keep uh, like so much old crap around and some of it, like recently I went and bought other people's crap just so I could feel nostalgic <laughs> about my past. Cause I got rid of my crap. Like I got, I got like toys here from friggin' eighties, bro. Just sitting here on the desk. I mean, look what I've got sitting oh, here I know. on my desk. I love yeah. it. I love it. You know what that is. Come on. Yeah, what, of course the DeLorean. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I shout out Talia Stanton. I, I interviewed Talia Stanton who's 22 and, and absolutely killing it in the art world. But she's like, is that, that's the Mandalorian. I nearly hung up on her. <laughs> <laughs> the Mandalorian. That's oh, funny. Wow. Yeah, dude. Oh, it's, man. um, I, I, man, it just, it's so cool to just have this chance to connect with you and, and hear a bit more about your story and your work. Uh, as I said before, I've just been, I've been admiring your work from afar for a long, a long time. And it's just so good to have a chance to talk with you. I, I, I appreciate it Same. all the more now. Appreciate it's, that. It's, it's just so cool, man. Where I, I'll let people know, but where's, where's the best place for people to find you and follow you online and, and connect with you. And, and, and also um, tell us, tell us what's next for you. What are some of the things that we can look forward to coming from the studio? What are some, some of the Epic projects that you're looking forward to getting into? Well, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I am teaching online. Um, that's a new thing with sentient. And that's been fun. You know, it's kind of an experiment because I've never taught online before. And I didn't know how it worked out, but my students are growing fast and it's been really cool. So that's, I do that. Um, every Friday I have a class at 1130, 230 and five o'clock mountain standard time. And then um, as far as the painting goes, um, there's always this uh, life of Christ series life and ministry of christ series that i'll be working on probably the whole my whole life just picking away at that 
And then, um, and then I'm thinking I've been out of gallery since my, my sabbatical in 2008, 2010 or 11. And uh, I've been living on just the residue of my years before that, you know, just clients and stuff that I'd already built up, but I'm kind of itching to get back into the gallery scene and start a new body of work. So I'm not sure, you know, I think that's going to be in my future. I'm not sure how far into my future, but I am really itching to start a new body of work. Um, and I'm not even sure what that's going to look like yet. So and as far as how to, I think I'm most active on Instagram, but I'm not active anywhere really, but my website is a little slower at updates, <laughs> but that would be jeffhine.com. And my Instagram is jeffhineart. I think it's Jeff underscore Hine underscore art, if I remember correctly. And then um, I also have my other Instagram of all of my distractions and hobbies. That's Jeff uh, Hine Studio. So that's the main ways to see what I'm doing. Jeff Hine, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed this. What a blast. Thank you so much for being on The Creative Endeavor. It's my pleasure. I'm a huge fan of your work and honored to be here. Well, thank you so much. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast. A huge shout out and thank you to Jeff Hine for joining me. If you haven't done so already, go and follow Jeff Hine on Instagram at Jeff underscore Hine underscore art and on his website, www.jeffhine.com. Check out his exceptional work there and make sure you're following his efforts. I know you're going to be just as inspired as I am by this guy. He's just incredible. Now, if you haven't already done so, please take a moment and leave me a rating or a review on whatever audio platform you're listening on. It makes a huge difference to the show. And in addition to that, if you wouldn't mind sharing this episode on social media and let other people know where you're hearing these inspiring conversations, help me spread the word to more people. I can't do it without you. And I just appreciate that extra effort. Again, if you missed it, there's an exclusive video version of this podcast. If you wanted to know about some of the paintings that we discussed in this episode, you'll find them on my Patreon page. And that link accompanies this podcast, but you'll find it by just searching my name on Patreon, Andrew Tischler Artist. Now I'm going to get out of here and get back to painting. It's been so much fun hanging out with you here in the studio. I'll be with you again very, very soon in another episode of The Creative endeavor.